co-chair of Project 3810, and Julie is the community manager. She does all the, she runs the show. So I do what she tells me. Um, we uh, have garnered this panel today to talk about the entertainment industry here in Oklahoma City. Um, it's got a lot of cool things happening, and we are we are primed for a lot of um, healthy food <coughs> in this area for sure. So um, today I have Ben um, e Easley Maynard, yes. and she is with RTO, and they do marketing um, for the entertainment industry. And then Maurice um, Johnson, he is actually a tenant here at Project 3810, and he helps people self-author, I mean, self-publish their books. So um, both of these guys have a background in music um, as well, and so that covers that industry. and. Um, uh, when it was 2022, Project 3810 joined the Oklahoma Motion Picture Association, and so we wanted to kind of start networking with the people in that industry and find out what was going on and get a little bit better handle on that. So we're members of that. We are going to be launching a podcast studio here in December. Um, I'll talk to you more about that update. I got updates. Right. Um, and that'll be a part of the community as well, so a service that you Anyway, with that in mind, I, let's give each of them, you know, like five minutes just to tell about what you do and, and, and you know, your business and your background a little bit. Five, we got plenty of time, so however long, but five minutes is a long time. Sometimes it seems like it's not that long. Sometimes it's a lot. So. Okay, well, I think I can rattle off about five minutes and let it go. <laughs> As she stated, my name is Maurice Johnson, and in fact, my background is music. Performing musician here for over 30 years, or at least 30 years, maybe 35 years. And uh, a lot of me, a lot of people know me from a band called After Five Jazz that came out in the mid to five and, and 93. And I was able to do a lot of New York and did a lot of Midwest and some classical concerts and things like that. And subsequently, when we came to a demise, when we talked about music, music business, <laughs> when we came, when we broke up in 93, uh, they just finished the George Lynch campaign, I started writing books. So in 1996, I had my first, my second book published, but it was titled Build and Manage Your Music Career in the Music Business. And so that was an interesting venture. So that's kind of one of the things that kind of got me into the publishing or writing aspect of things. Is that in conjunction with my entrepreneurial endeavors or uh, the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, uh, spirit that I've always possessed. And also during that time, I, I developed a software product called Theorama, Business Management so I was really in, uh, in, ingrained in the, in the music aspect of things because I believed in what I did and I believed in musicians. Um, so, and uh, built guitars for a while, built a studio called Guitar Group. So my, myself and Mr. James Dell uh, developed that, uh, came back from guitar. But uh, going further, as the years went by and our band came to the demise, I started working solo and once again back in the music business. But um, as recently as, let's say, as we got into the 2000s, 2018 so, and so on, I had amassed about five of my own books by being with traditional publishers, uh, traditional publishing houses. And uh, there was a time in the, uh, during that time, my daughter was, was always writing. She was quite ambitious. She said she's written over 30 books uh, in the medical uh, field and stuff to help save her money because I've always done graphic arts, uh, graphic arts. So I would design her book covers. Kept me quite busy designing a series of books. Book covers, book covers. Oh my gosh. And then she began to self publish. She started self publishing her books. And I said, well, you know, I, you know, I might try that because I always wanted to revisit one of my books. I had the copyright rescinded uh, with one of my books years ago. And I said, I always wanted to revisit it, get some changes and update it and different things. So my first book was, in fact, I took Build and Manage Music Career and reworked that one and self published that one. Building their music business. And I did a, uh, I actually did a three book version of that. I just broke it into three uh, sections. Then later, uh, later on, as I began to continue publishing and 
putting things out there, self-publishing is a handle on the whole that. A lot of other people would come to me and ask me questions about self-publishing or how to get it done or could I help them with it because I've got a background. I've always had a background in graphics. I love graphics. And one of my first clients that kind of kicked this off actually happened around uh, 2017. And you know, I still hadn't had that business thing there. So she was my first client and uh, we published his book. Then a few months later, someone else came to me. same time I had, you know, wheels rolling in my head to, to publish more books, so I did that. And then the whole self, uh, eventually self-publish me was born. That's the name of our book, the self-publish me. So I'm an advocate, I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate for um, not only business-minded people or musicians, but authors too. And the thing about authors, not only do we publish through the cover design, through the interior formatting of both their books to a, uh, to a publishing entity, uh, it's that support. Because a lot of authors, uh, first time authors, have problems believing in their own words or believing in themselves. And because of my background and I've seen other people you know, come forth, we really try to instill that in, 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 in them in a, 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 sense of, a, a sense of confidence. And one thing we like to do for the self-published authors is that they have so many things rolling in their head, you know, ISBN numbers, covers, in, interior format, and all this kind of stuff. Editors, where does it, you know, how do I put it all together? Well, that's our job to do all that. We like to take all that stress from them. And they're, we, I say to a lot of them as we do our, our general consultation, I say, your job is to finish your manuscript. Our job is to do the rest. So to put their mind at ease and rest their mind so they can focus on that. We try to instill in, in them to let them realize that they have a team behind them. You know, uh, front cover design, uh, interior formatting, editor, illustrator, if needed, things like that. So uh, eventually, not too long ago, a few short months ago, we made the decision as, as far as growth was concerned. And I always wanted to be in some type of office because I knew we needed to be in an office to stay, to, to go forward. And uh, finally made the decision to come here. And you know, this, this is a very, very nice, uh, very nice uh, facility. It's a good first step for us. So we're still growing and uh, have a lot of faith in authors. And we're here to offer what we can offer.
government jobs and military and things like that. But I really, really love the program and I learned more about conflict resolution and peace building. And then my unit did all the arts to serve in that. So I came back to Oklahoma City and wanted to start something from that, that place, like peace building the arts. And so I started RTO, it was a brainchild in 2019. So everybody knows, like when you started something in 2019, how the world shifted in 2020. And so, you know, really like it really evolved. And when I came back here and I was talking about it, um, the international words didn't quite translate into our, our local community. They were like, well, what are you doing? Are you working for the UN or what, you know? I was like, no, I'm trying to do local stuff, you know? And so really I started to have to kind of change my language of like relationship building, community building, you know, and, and really be able to connect with my audience. And so I really asked myself like, what's the ways I can I looked back on my background and what I had been doing all, all along was branding and marketing and you know and production and so um, you know and I was like I don't even love those words because they didn't you know what I mean I was like but it's what but what that's what I've been doing and I I was really lucky to work under um, like Matt Sansbury who he has Nami Design he does great branding projects they just signed on with the airport they've done huge huge branding projects um, he and uh, Graham Colton had a company at the time and that's who I worked for and so they were developing Jones, you know, he does all the music over there and he's working with Prairie Surf to music. And so I had really great mentors at the time. And so we got to kind of work on those types of projects. Um, and so branding, marketing, production was what I continued to like develop RTO around. Um, but yeah, we've done, we started, you know, again, um, with music, but then even started to grow into film with, we looked, I was looking at what was happening during 2020 and that our state was deemed, um, film was deemed So music was really, really struggling, and I was like, oh, this is really, really tough. It was just heartbreaking to see all my musician friends in our music industry really sinking, but at the same time, we were kind of watching film come up, and in my mind, I was like, how can they all help each other, and you know, how can we provide opportunities for each other? So I got really interested in kind of our film world, and I joined the um, Oklahoma Motion Picture Alliance, that's how Vicki and I met, and I did a marketing sponsorship for them for almost a year, and then also started working So um, I told Vicki, I said, I don't, I don't consider myself a film expert at all. There's so many people that are like working deeply in the state, but I think the advantage that I have had this past year is to kind of be on the sidelines watching all the players and watching all the development happen. And there are, there's always going to be like politics, right, in like this industry. I mean, we know there, there is, but like I, I felt like I could kind of see, oh, I see what you're trying to do and I see what you're trying to do and maybe you're kind of betting heads at it, but I think it's really all important. Especially as we're building our film industry in Oklahoma, um, and one of the w wonderful things I've seen in our state is we have really grounded artists and filmmakers and musicians. And you know, there's this kind of criticism right now, like, well, we don't want Hollywood here. You know what I mean? But but really, I mean, if you start to know like our industry and our you know these leaders in our industries, it's all people that I have met at least that are coming from a really like heart based, creative, artistic place that want to make waves and want to jobs here. I think that's something that really attracted me to the Motion Picture Alliance. And um, then at the end of the day, being able to work with everybody was like, this, there is a peace building aspect, right? We're all kind of coming together, building relationships, building community, you know, getting to know each other. And so that's like, it's come full circle for me to get to know the film industry, but also like uh, him from the music industry as well. So. Cool. Um, I think one thing that is really apparent from what both of you they said is that being an artist is being a founder. And I feel like that is a huge disconnect that artists don't see themselves as a business and they don't necessarily have the business um, acumen to help them understand what they should do and how they can you know, increase their taxes and things like that. So, um, and it's too, uh, it, I definitely believe in the arts be able to see your arts and have that balance and figure out ways to make a living at it. So what you guys are doing is, is I've been a lifetime of doing that, really. So um, kudos. Let's get all of our inner artists out. Under the table, you're done. No, You'll find cramps. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I have a couple questions um, to get the 
to keep this rolling. Um, and this might be a little bit more on the film side, but what is happening in Oklahoma? And they'll take me in that. But what are the, the names we should be following on, on social medias or whatever um, to kind of be more aware?
something that I've learned is that those types of levels of villain, they are based almost in like a military like model. It is very much stay in your lane, like you just you're an expert in this and you don't cross over and you know it's very there's a very strict model in those types of films. Mid to smaller level films it's very collaborative. You know, you're just kinda all hands on deck, everybody's kinda doing everything. So I can see where they're trying to bring in people who had um, a lot more experience to work on those types of larger films, but then also we do want to train and we want to create jobs here. So I hope that, I know that's a long-winded answer, but there's a yeah, lot of things going on in the state. With, yes, and so yeah. it kind of hopefully sets a platform for anything you guys, you all are hearing. That's kind of what I've observed across the board, so. Awesome. Um, is there anything um, in the publishing space that is unique or like when it comes to local lobbying or any kind of hurdles? Well, it's not from that perspective. It's almost more on a personal level. You know, we're dealing with independent authors and they're in their independent world. And one thing, one of the big questions as far as self-publishing is concerned, is a self-published book a real book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you might not have the, the financial means or the promotional or marketing prowess to push it out there like a multi-million dollar uh, traditional brick and mortar pub publisher, but uh, you certainly can do what, like she said, we're all entrepreneurs, and I, I, I encourage, I, I encourage authors or anybody, real quick question, to think like an industry within yourself, because you do in fact have to wear many hats. A lot of times you have to, uh, I wouldn't suggest you wear your own editor hat, but <laughs> <laughs> you want a professional, you really want to uh, outsource professional uh, things Makes you stand out, uh, that, but you might have to promote your own. I would, I would. Uh, it's, it's very important that you push your own book. One thing uh, you certainly don't want to do as an independent author is to publish a book and go missing. You know, maybe it's not just the book title that's important or the story within. It's the author. People want to know the backstory. They want to know about you, the author. That's just as fascinating as as the book itself. It truly is, because you know when it's time to do some marketing and promotion, somebody wants to interview you, they're not just gonna talk about your book. It's cool if you have a cool, a nice, interesting uh, title, a compelling title, in conjunction maybe you have a subtitle as well. There's a story behind that, but the story, that book wouldn't have come about in the first place if it weren't for you. So your story is just as important. Just keep in mind that as an independent author, you are in fact an industry within yourself. And that's what we try to encourage people for us to think that way. Think as much as in the book as well. And don't think that that book make you millions of dollars. Like you gotta work. Marketing. <laughs> <laughs> How um uh it's do you what will your self published book get on like Amazon and stuff? Exactly. Yeah there's, yeah? A, there's a lot of uh okay. platforms that POD print on demand platforms out there, Amazon, uh, uh Barnes and Noble Press, um Ingram Spark is and various aggregators out there, Graphic Digital, uh, Book Baby, things like that. And so there's a lot of, in, in this day and age, there's a lot of outlets for you to become a published author. You know, when people think of Amazon KDP, when they hear KDP, uh, they think instantly ebook. You know, what's KDP? That's KDP is Kindle uh, Direct Publishing. Oh, yeah. You know, that was, you know, was, it was originally dispersed as ebooks, you know, but we're well beyond ebooks. And one thing that we try to do is design authors a book that can stand up against anything out there, anything out on the shelf. We, we feel proud of our work, but we want the author to feel proud as well. We, another thing that we like to encourage is, you know, when an author publishes their book, if they're doing a local uh, book signing, we want to be there, let us know. We want to show our support. We're not ashamed of what we do. But yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of sources out there uh, in this day and age, uh, thanks to, you know, the internet and digital, just like music, you know. Now, you know, once upon a time, we used to think that you can only produce a CD or an album, you have to get a record deal. Well, you make your own deal. I mean, you can buy your own facilities. And, and thanks to a computer being the heart of just about anything, anywhere from film production to book publishing to music production and so forth and so on, that you are in the industry within yourself. Awesome. All right, I have more questions, but I have to So between film, self-publishing, and music, people in the entrepreneur space talk about the digital skill stack. What would you say are kind of the top three to five skill stacks that a high schooler or an early college student 
would start developing to be easily integrated into any part of the insurance payment plan. First, understanding the arts, who would be an arts group, music, uh, writing, literature, and uh, uh, film, movies. You know, it, it all starts with a storyline. So understanding that is, but as far as skills, skill, skill stacks, obviously it's computer. I, it's, it's unfortunate that I see people today that are afraid of computers, that, that they just don't get there. But they are afraid of social media. Acquaint yourself with social media. A lot of us, unfortunately, we get so political in our mind and we find ourselves, I did cast it one way, and come up with these crazy theories, I don't want to go there. And it, 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 can keep, it can keep us out of things. You know, we're in a world, it is what it is, it's not gonna change, well, it's gonna change, but we're in it. You know, whatever the case is, if we don't, if we're not dealing with physical money or whatever, we're in this world, we gotta work with, we just gotta be able to work with that. I, I was, uh, I know I'm getting off the thing, but I saw a, a video of this guy ranting at a bank because they didn't pay money. That was really weird, they didn't pay cash. <laughs> you want to pay them cash and then he's telling us, kill it's a changing world we live in. Yeah. So if anything, we want to open our minds and, and, and change. I'm 63 years old and I have to think differently. I can't think the way I did uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago. It's cool, I, I'm glad I have that experience, that life platform to take me here, but if my mindset wasn't willing to change, I couldn't grow. So uh, I think it's a, a person. Is there a specific software that, me? that is specialized, like kids in high school or that? I won't say a specific. If you talk about a specific industry, yeah, there's all kind of softwares that will accommodate that, but it all starts with a basic, uh, what do we call it, a, uh, a basic, uh, no, a, a basic, what do you call those things? Uh, uh, Aptitude. Typing. Yeah, just some basic knowledge. <laughs> uh, no. Acumen, uh, uh, is yeah. that the word? Well, anyway, uh, word, let's say word. So they just basic, get acquaint yourself. I remember when I first got a computer, I wanted every piece of software I felt like I was getting ready to run the world. I want this, I want that. Come on, man, you gotta tone it down, you gotta focus on something. So I, you know, I, I dug graphics, so I acquainted myself with some of the Adobe products, uh, Photoshop. Uh, acquainted myself, obviously, with Word, and, um, you know, a lot of things were new when files were getting bigger, when we trans uh, transitioned from the floppy disk to the CD and all that kind of thing, and hold more information, we had the trash drive, you pay five, I remember paying $700 for a 100 megabyte external hard drive. $700. I was always on the edge of technology. I paid $1,200 for a 300 DPI black and white printer from Apple. $1,200 back in the day. I was always on the edge here, you know, but so we have to, we have to change our mindset and embrace technology. We have to embrace that technology. So you want to, as far as software is concerned, whatever industry you're, you're interested in, there's a software out there to accommodate that. If you're interested in digital art, that's another thing. If you're an artist, I would uh, encourage a lot of young people or anybody to acquaint themselves with digital art. I went out and bought uh, a couple years ago, I bought a, a digital drawing tablet. Big company drawing tablet, very nice. I don't know what I'm doing with it, but I bought it. I bought another item that helps you do things with that. Uh, but, but I'm still trying to learn because that's different for me. Now, it's, instead of just putting the pencil to the paper, about all this other stuff. I've got to think about the, the user interface, the software that I'm working in. I've got to think about the physical device. I've got to think all these parameters. It's very, it can be daunting, but you want to overcome that. And it, it's like driving a car. You know, gotta use the steering wheel, gotta use the brakes, gotta use this and that. And you just gotta use everything and become learning about it. Now let's say one other thing. When I started my, when I started my recording studio, it was my home, uh, home studio, I was just like I just described. I was overwhelmed, you know, my, my background is, history, is uh, music, jazz guitar, so I recorded two CDs in my, my own home studio. So I bought all this stuff. I bought a, a iMac, 24 inch iMac, great. I bought a, a have all the digital converter, I bought my monitors, I bought the software, I was using Logic at the time, and several other things that connects with all this. But all I want to do is write and record my music. I don't want to do all this other stuff. I'm not in, I don't have the luxury to be in the studio where I have an empty ear turning the knobs for me. I had to do that. I had to sit in that chair and do everything. And I was like overwhelmed. You know, I'm the guitarist and everything. And so the way I looked at it, and you might want to look at this, 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 this dates my age. If ever, anybody remember Star Trek, and uh, 
William Shatner, James T. Kirk, to the last that put my position, myself in the position of James T. My, my system is the USS Enterprise, and I'm James T. Kirk. He knew just about everything about that ship. He may not know how to work, but he knew everything about his ship. So instead of looking at, at my system as individual, individual components, I had to look at it as one unit designed to do what I wanted to do with it. And the objective was to master that so it accommodates me. It's, it's a tool. It should work for me. I shouldn't work for him. So hope that, bottom line is <laughs> just be open-minded when it comes to software, it comes to technology, to try to learn just what you need. You don't have to learn it all.
Um, uh, that's, I think, a big scary box that gets intimidating to look into, um, but it's super important to help make decisions. Um, that's where data can serve you. you know, yeah, like, yeah. And where if you're trying to speak to a specific audience, if you're putting a book out about veterans, right, and you want to speak to veterans, where are your veterans living? Are they on Facebook? Are they on Instagram? Are they, you know, and you can start to find through your analytics where they live and where they are paying attention and where they're engaging. Yep, yep. Awesome. All right, any other questions out there? Okay, so now my curiosity, especially going to your point of arts literacy and understanding, mm -hmm. just in general. So what do you think the extent is that Oklahoma audiences need to be educated in order to enjoy analog forms of art? Oh, man, that, 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 that's a great question. That, that is a good question. Uh, be present. I'm going to say be present. Be present and, and be present at anything that's brought forth. You know, Oklahoma offers a lot of things. Whether it's, uh, whether it's our, our, our orchestra or uh, um, film and, and arts, uh, uh, book signings and, and things, just don't be, uh, just be present. Make yourself open and available to, to get out and, and learn those things. Expose yourself to things that you've never been exposed to before. Embrace culture, embrace uh, technical changes, embrace what Oklahoma has to offer. We also we have our tourism department, so forth and so on, where we do have our where we where we're growing in many ways, but be present. That's my request. <laughs> I feel so strongly about this question. <laughs> I think coming from, I mean, and we've been in, you've been in the music industry longer than yes. I have, but we've been in it together. And I remember, I mean, when you're like way back when, I think it's getting better, but people walk up and they go, ugh, $5 cover, <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, I think something that, like one of the things I really, really preach is like if Oklahomans want us to have an art scene, you have to support the art scene. You have to show up. You have to come out. You have to buy merchandise. You have to buy tickets. It's like, and I think I think we've kind of come from this place where, you know, we, it was a newer art scene, and you kind of get pat on the head, and they're like, "That's cute that you're doing art. That's you know, that's real sweet." But like, they didn't understand. Most people from what way back when didn't understand the larger picture of how the arts is really serving us as a community. The value it brings to a community, and now I think we are. Here Right? We have these industries, we have film, we have music, we have publishing. There are real industries here in our state, but I think that for people to realize that we need to keep them, they need to support them. And we have a lot of veteran communities in Oklahoma, and so, you know, I get it. I get that you're, like, trying to take your kids to soccer, and you're just, you know, you're cooking and all that stuff, but, like, also understanding that when you take your kids to a music show or you take your kids, you know, to, like, a film thing, like, that brings so much value to not only that mindset of not just like oh I might take my wife to a, like a big paycom concert once a year and that's all we're gonna do but like no like you know really um, make a point once a month to be like hey we're gonna go out to scissor tail and watch the concert and we're gonna take our kids or you know make that a part of the lifestyle because if we want to keep it we have to support it and if we don't it goes away you know what I mean so like understanding that connection is I'm very passionate about <laughs> Anybody else have questions? Besides, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. I'll go next. We'll take turns. Um, uh, okay. For the non artists out here, what supporting industry do you guys see that can help the art scene that maybe if somebody wants to do a business? I mean, in the film industry, there's you know people that can get, they're getting trained as grips and they're opening different types of businesses that can with the production and set designs and all different, you know, hair, skin, hair and makeup. And, but is there any less obvious things or that you can call our attention to? There's a magic word, entrepreneur business, behind the scenes, accounting, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, marketing. Yeah, but yeah that, that, you know, uh, yeah, the business, that's the, people don't understand what goes on behind. They see all the shiny, they see the shiny objects, but they don't know what see what's behind that shiny object. There's a lot of support there. And that's the, that is the business. So yes, that's something that's out of the art realm. Yeah, what was the name they called that? Important, like, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an acronym for that. I, I forget now. I, I want to say it's Neil, Neil, do you remember? It was said at one of, but it was like, um, yeah, accounting and 
insurance and right. um, I know what you're talking about. Uh, legal. right now they can't find enough accountants right <laughs> like I mean oh, it's wow. just you know it's like they're in I one of my friends Jen she's in that realm it's like they need more of that they need more of this infrastructure we need it as a state so if you're not an artist but you're like I want to be involved in the arts world that is like a really big part with music I mean I know a, a big part of that is developing the management and the you know the representation and the you know the back end work of like what it takes to like move an artist along as what's an artist and I know that's something that like ACM really set out to do, you know, and um, I think that they're still plugging along with that, but really creating more of a music business and, and infrastructure behind musicians. I mean, it's all, it's kind of like the unsexy yes. parts, but it's really right. important for it to grow. You know what I mean? Like you see like <laughs> all the, you know, right. actors and musicians, but they need an, a support and infrastructure and it is a true team. And all of those elements are, are, are rudimentary, but they're important with any industry. So the bookkeeping, the, the legal aspect of things, um, all of that. Uh, it's the underlying force for the firm. The, the, the foundational. Yeah, foundational. Yeah, the principle that carries any business. I don't care what it is. Yeah. So, so do not, do not, deny yourself of that. Do not, do not um, be ignorant of it. You know, I'm in, as an entrepreneur, I've always been in, in pursuit of, uh, how do I say it? Not being ignorant or, or, or paying attention to things that uh, that should get paid paid attention to. I love you know I love what I do. I'm a topical sense. I love the graphics. I love the art. I love all of it. But there's still business to do in the back of the scene. I, you know, my wife hears me sounding frustrated when I'm dealing with the accounting or whatever this and that and all this. But I enjoy it. But I want to, I want to empower myself with that knowledge. There you go. Make the decision. Knowledge is power. Empower yourself with knowledge. Write a book, empower yourself. <laughs> Run the back end, empower yourself even more. Yeah. And you want to have a lot of fun doing marketing and PR because I, marketing, honestly, it is kind of the first thing we go when people are like, well, we don't have any more money. And it's like, yeah, but actually, that's how you're going to make money. You like to know that for people to know about you. But also, marketing for me has felt like it's like kind of the house, it's like the housekeeping. Like your eyes and ears, you know everything that's going on because you, that, you were responsible for like getting out on the public eye and you're like, I have to know every back to my original like introduction like I've kind of watched all of this stuff unfold with our film industry because it's like that's how you know you're kind of in that back end you're in every meeting you're in every you know what I mean like you hear everything and so because it's my job to formulate oh how do we get this out there and like a, a digestive message so that's a lot of fun and you've already step out of your comfort zone doing those things that make you feel uncomfortable because that's how you grow yeah. if it doesn't challenge you it doesn't change Always done it this way. Do it this way. Try something new. Rock the boat. Cool. All right. Go for it. All right. So there's a couple ways to think about this question. The first way is what are you noticing as far as the stories that people are hungry for or are going to be hungry for here in about two quarters? The other thing to think about is where do you see the zeitgeist being most hopeful as far as the arts that are needed? So there's two different ways to think about it. What are the stories that you are hearing people are really hungry for that aren't being made? Or the other way to think about it is where do you see the cultural zeitgeist of the artistic needs of our culture? Mm. Heading? Yeah. A couple different options. Yeah. One small, one big. I have some thoughts on that. Do you want me to start? I want you to expound first. Okay. I think um, a man, a little name named Martin Scorsese, already symbol of communist, right? I think, especially in our state, there are so many stories and experiences that have not been told. I mean, I grew up in, in Oklahoma, and I had no idea about the Eighth Stage murders. I had no about the Tulsa race riots. You know, I had no idea. I had no idea about Black Wall Street, right? I had no idea, and I grew up here. And these, I mean, and our black towns in Oklahoma, our indigenous towns in Oklahoma, like what those, even the the history behind that, the working relationships between those towns and people, and I just, I think that we have so many, 
stories that are just waiting to be told and that we can learn from. And one of the privileges I've had is to work with the Tall Chief Theater that is Little Theater in Fairfax, Oklahoma, and they served as a police station during the Reign of Terror. And they were the first Native American founded theater that they that we know of in the whole in the United States. And that was founded by Alex Tall Chief for his Prima Ballerina daughters, Marjorie and Maria. And so, I mean, even there you have the ballet, you have Native American theater, you have the birth of the FBI, where the, so you have this, these rich stories. And also understanding how it affects us today. So I've been really interested in the town of Fairfax, Oklahoma. And for those of you who've seen the film or will see the film, um, part of my, my graduate program was, and it's a mouthful, but it's post-conflict state reconstruction and sustainability. And we looked at all over the world how states and countries have recovered from genocide, from civil war, from natural disasters. And I think, I think what we've been missing in our country is we have missed um, looking at our own towns and our own Native American genocide, right? And our own these places that have really continued to suffer because of the history of them. And so Fairfax is one of them. I mean, that you had, you know, the, this really rich group of Osage tribe, this, you know, that had money coming in and they, you know, it's like this, and why they were there in the first place. And then, you know, cause it was a, the land was not deemed valuable and then it was valuable. And then how the government kind of maneuvered that away from them. And they, you know, it's just so, there's so much behind it. And that is important for us, I think, as we went So that has been a project that I have just, it's been very eye-opening, it's been a privilege to work with that group and, and the theater, and so that's, I think that's where we're, I hope that's where we're going, is to start to, to reveal these stories. Yeah, I'd love to see that happen. It's, it's very good. Uh, kind of on the same note, uh, when you think of the way she started off, uh, and once again, I'll speak about authors. Uh, a lot of authors come to us with, uh, whether it's fantasy or and a lot of people, you know, want to do memoirs and tell their life stories. And we all have a life story. We have all, I think everybody has at least two books in the book. We have a story to tell. And some of the stories are very tragic. Some of them are, are very profound and heart-wrenching, but you hear their isolated stories. And a lot of people can relate to those stories. So in a sense, some of their stories is almost everybody's story. There's a lot of, uh, I've noticed a lot of young women have gone through a lot of things uh, that's unspoken, and unfortunately, that's the story of a lot of people. But one thing I encourage artists, uh, writers, to do when they're when they're pursuing up an autobiographical type of uh, book, uh, non a nonfiction of that nature, is to incorporate historical parallels. You know, to place the reader there. One of my last books, uh, Dragon's Life Under the Sea Before Tomorrow, is not is based on my own autobiography, but it's not just my story. Uh, uh, a lot of things she just recently touched on that the uh, Tulsa Massacre. I talked about that subtly or, or referenced that in, in different contexts of my uh, timeline for my story. I referenced the Green Book, uh, various towns, and I'm doing some research right now for another uh, book of art that I grew up that I mentioned that I grew up in, and, and I want to know more about that park. It was called Burden Park back in the 60s and 70s. Burden Park, and I'm, I'm telling the history that's in there, but there's history and you show that. There's a lot of stories that lies underneath. It's like excavating, excavating a, 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 a dig. I don't know how to say that. But uh, Burton Park uh, came into place in 1945 in El Reno, Oklahoma. It was uh, originally it was originally built in 1931. It was originally called uh, called uh, Lawrence Dunbar Park in 1931. But I was very fascinated about that history. Uh, and going back even further. That land was originally patented, patented to a, uh, a Comanche Indian by the name of Jesse Je Jesse Curtis in 1892 by Edward Benjamin Harrison. So so fascinating as I do my research, uh, working on another, another book idea. So when you share those stories, and, and you, it, it's a world of stories and things that should not be forgotten historic, of historical significance that people should know. And learn. Unfortunately, we live in a climate where some of that is, is being threatened right now. So it could be further exemplified in, in the written word in books and in movies and in cults. So yeah, uh, uh, I believe in really uh, revealing those stories. I don't know if I, how how if I've articulated your question well enough. But that's, that's what I do. But that's what I do. <laughs> Lot of trauma behind these stories, but again, 
question one over here. Back to you. I was born in 1959, and once again, back to the historical parallel. I talk about my mother who, who died in 1966, and I talk about some historical references. Uh, she was born in uh, 1947, the same year Helen Del Infante and Victoria Hill was born, the same year they started building the, uh, uh, what they call the uh, Mount Rushmore, the same year the, the uh, uh, Globe Trotter. There was a song called Strange Fruit. I don't know if any of you know about it. I heard the song Strange Fruit. Anybody familiar with the song Strange Fruit? Okay. <laughs> okay. Strange Fruit Fruit was, uh, it was the blatant uh, story uh, about hanging Negroes. Uh, and it was an event, it originally event took place in 1930 something. Eric Hughes was in the Indian photography to, to uh, support it. But anyway, there was a, a Jewish guy, I can't remember his name. He, after seeing that, he drew patch notes around his postcards and all these kind of things, celebrating the events, learning about the thing. And uh, he was compelled to write a poem that was something that was in the song. It was called Strange Fruit. Billy Holiday released that in 1959, the year of my birth. I would, had I would, would I, if I had been aware of that uh, when I wrote my book, I would have put that in there, not expounding so much on it but simply as a historical marker or historical reference. Because what I try to do in my book, and I would recommend that, you know, if you want to sustain history or backstories, is to put out little breadcrumbs, make, make people aware. Uh, you know, I, I, so 1959 was a significant day, the year of my birth, and when that song was recorded. But um, as, as a little tidbits, as we played, uh, played our park and, and we collected junk and sold it to the local junk dealer to go buy candy at the penny, the, the store, the neighborhood store, or at the canteens at the park. In a way, that was that was uh, helping power uh, a local economy in that little area of town that we live. And it also exemplifies the, the strategy behind Black Wall Street, because the, uh, it's a dollar that stayed in that community and that helped grow that community. community. So in a way, I use that to kind of educate young readers, just a little bit. Because it's, it's not, not really a history lesson or a, a lesson in economics, but just breadcrumbs to history, breadcrumbs to stories, stories that should be forgotten. I, I have a personal question. Oh, you got a question? Yes. Okay, cool. A new, new questioner. <laughs> um, Film industry wise, here in a few years we're going to have a little bit, a little bit of an inflection point because, you know, in a, in a, in a month we're going to have an election that talks about, um, uh, oh, that votes on um, funding an arena, which it most likely site to save money for the city to not have to buy land would be the site of the current Prairie Surf Studios, and so uh, I had talked to Matt, uh, we saw him at a presentation a couple years ago, and I asked him the question of, what are you going to do when, when the Cox Center is gone? And he said, "We since we started, we've been looking for another place, you know, you know, land to, to build studio, you know, studios and so on and so forth." Um, I'm just curious. I don't know if I don't know if you have any not, not, that, not that inside information is necessary for that question to be answered, but I'm just curious what you think will be will kind of happen with the film industry, for, especially for big productions. If if it's you know if the transition isn't very smooth, you know, because you want to really you you should probably be building that stuff right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that it's all ready when when you know we have to move out of the other place from the conversations i've had i think it's still kind of this big looming question i haven't i haven't gained any like super insider information of like what's really going to happen but it is it is a big question in the industry because i think going back to the original conversation is prairie surf has really been kind of the hub of bringing these big films i mean there's some critics who might say hey this is not helping our industry like we need to kind of build from this bottom up instead of top to bottom model so um, i don't know that's a big question like what if Prairie Surf goes away, where are we left? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I hope you know, like, but it's like, yeah, I think there's just so many different um, opinions and angles to this. And um, I think we need it all. I hope that they find a home and I hope that, you know what I mean? But yeah, it's, it's a big, <laughs> big question. I wish I could answer better. <laughs> but it's a great point to bring up for our film industry. Yeah. There's 
plenty of land, plenty of land. They, well, I mean, they will survive. Even the warehouse spaces, I mean, a lot of our cannabis industry has um, like consumed oh, yeah. a lot of our warehouses, honestly. <laughs> and so yeah. it has been hard sometimes for the film industry to be like, well, we need a space for this, but like, but, you know, they. I mean, if you look at what New Mexico did, I mean, they ba they basically built a huge lot of a bunch of buildings for sound studios, for their for their film industry. Um, you know, I personally, I wouldn't be surprised like if we, you know, if if there was some kind of other thing like the arena vote where we had had to have some sort of vote to extend that tax to pay for building studios so that Prairie Surf had a place to move so we can build the arena if it passes that sort of thing. You know, I I, I wouldn't be too terribly surprised just because of the importance that's been put behind um, that industry and it being here and so on and so forth. Yeah, and that's a question of who bought up the big town, you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. 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 I'll tell marketing for you. Yeah, I know, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get marketing. Um, mine was um, not so much, I guess, well, I guess as an, a an actor, you see people with stage names or whatever, but uh, the pen name, I mean, it, it's, it's pros and cons, is there, yeah, that's something I haven't delved into uh, deeply. One of our last uh, conversations was about the Dutch Muslim Jews wanted to use a pen name. And it does pose a, if you're an unknown officer, you're, you're going to stay unknown. So it, 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 el it, introduces, an ele it introduces an ele element of confusion and awkwardness. So say, for instance, you do a book signing. I love all these questions, but uh, this is one of my favorite. I'm probably piggyback on your answer. I know, like, I'm <laughs> so, I have some opinions on this too. I'm so passionate about this question because working with artists and even venues, I mean, I I will be like, oh yeah, I heard of this show, I want to, I go to, and so I'll go to the artist Instagram, the venue Instagram, and there's nothing about it, right? And I'm having nothing, and I'm like pulling my hair out. I just want to like be like, ah, you know. And so, I mean, it's just, I think it's understanding. I think it's helping, like, even artists and and venues understand like how because I've talked to an artist and he's like oh well it was kind of like behind it was like in the carousel of, you know and I'm just like no 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 you know it's like helping just even our grassroots like artists and venues understand like you need to 
mirror that across and tag people. And like working with the festivals, one of the best things we would do is we would create social media assets and it'd be like time, place, art, or whatever that is. And then we would email it out to everybody and we would even give them a little like copy and paste, like copy and paste. So we make it really easy for people to like put that and like start to cross promote. But I think people, the gap I see tried to even find it and I guess I'm not going anymore. So making it really accessible, I think that's what's even going back to entrepreneurship. Um, part of entrepreneurship is you're putting yourself out there is removing barriers for people to access you. So make it accessible, make yourself accessible and think of those little things because they go a long way. Somebody might not come, probably won't come to your show if they don't, if they can't even find you, you know? So I would say that is like a big, big sticky point for me. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree too, about a year or so ago, So they would, you know, because we're, now we're dealing with the orchestra and things like that, because it's not, we're talking about culture. Not everybody gets a chance. Some communities or some some groups don't get really get a chance to experience that. So they had to convey, uh, as, as their platform grant, where they had needed to disperse their advertisement for less fortunate communities uh, where they could see them. So whether it be schools or hospitals or they're, you know, they're talking about this, but. But yeah, that was an important thing. So promotion is very important. Um, social media is one of the most common realms out there. And it's, in many ways, it's, I don't want to say it's free because you have those algorithms that's just killing it, squashing everything that people pay for. But yeah, that's something, a certain sense of consciousness that has to be uh, taken into your grant. Just don't be just something about it, assume that everybody's gonna know about it. You feel something. You adding to that another, another issue that has kind of been to everything is there's less journalists, artistic journalists around to cover yes. uh, some of the stuff. Yeah, and knowing them, so knowing who Dennis is, knowing his projects, um, make Oklahoma weirder. Evan Jarvix, who's a mutual friend of ours, he is constantly putting out content. He's a former tenant as well. Yeah, yeah, and so um, I think going back to that though of when people, the public knowing. Well, I haven't seen you promote stuff. I'm like, I know, because I just 
hours doing this, or you know. And so it's like I try really hard, but it is very daunting. Like you're constantly creating content, putting out content um, for it's like that's not I don't get paid to do that, right? And I love to do it, and I want to do it, but like there's some seasons I'm like I don't have the energy to do it. So I think the pub that's where the public can kind of step in and go, okay, we want to support you, and like kind of rallying around these journalists and these these new venues and these artists. So. We we talked a little bit about. Ancillary business opportunities, as far as like um, supporting the, the arts, and um, so like in that area, um, you know, the, there are bands who don't even have websites, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people are like, "Well, it's, social media is where it's at." However, um, to me, I, I, as a web person, I would I would recommend web first, social media second, and the reason is because you own that outright. Yeah. The social media platforms with the algorithms and everything else, they they can they can do something and it could tweak how you're found or what have you, whereas the website, you're gonna be spidered by it or crawled by a search engine. You know, somebody searching on mobile on their on their phone is gonna most likely find it, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, but you should always do that as your face, um, uh, and preferably put a few words behind it, like in a blog post style thing. Um, uh, even if it's literally just uh, re rewording what's gonna be put on social or what have you. But that should be first, and then the social social stuff should be second because it's going to be found more 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 quickly. Um, and the problem with that, though, is that there's probably not a lot of um, web savvy artists. There are some, I'm sure, um, or folks that will connect them to um, uh, you know the, the technical folks that can help them do those things. You know. Yeah, and I hundred percent agree. I always call our websites like the mothership. You know what I mean? Like have your mothership, and if you're really if we're creating a marketing plan like that's where your like main messaging goes that's where every that's your mothership and then you have like almost like your little tentacles kind of almost like an octopus like just coming out and it, it's like working smarter not harder you're not having to recreate the wheel every time you're trying to put out content because you already have some messaging there you have your photos there you, you can just you can push it out on your platforms um, I think that's where AI and you can go back to your question and your answer is like what's like right now there's like with AI um, you can like click, click, website, I'm like creating my website through this AI, and it can maybe just be an informational page, it may not have all the SEO behind it, because you don't have like a web developer really like guiding through that, but I think that, I do think that there are a lot of artists and people out there who can do it with what we have now, it's just a little intimidating sometimes for people, but I think it's like, and that's what, I mean, when I first started even my business, I took a week, I mean, I think my daughter was three years old, and I was like, go make your own food, like I like was literally, I took a week and immersed myself in like, how do you build a website, you know what I mean, and like design a website, and so I think now, that was years and years and years ago before we had the tools that we have now, so I think like, um, I think you're right, like always have your website, but I think it's more accessible now to even build one if you don't know, you know, if you're not coming from that background. And that's, and that's one of the things I love to hate, I've been doing my own website for a long, long time, we even had uh, my main domain name, MaurieJohnson.com, taken. that businesses like even restaurants like they seem to be more serious about their business than their website yeah. like I take them more seriously too yeah. Yeah. and I, I feel from a social from an what I tell all of our entrepreneurs that we work with is yeah social media is the you know the evil empire that we have to use and, and then that, that's one of the things because a lot of people are like I don't want social media and then it's like, but it's a tool that you have to use. But I'm like, embrace Google My Business, especially if you're local. And I feel like, because you can post, you know, the same content, and and if people are looking for something, they're gonna go, you know, concerts near me, or like, you know, live music tonight. Um, and Google will serve up first what it shows on your review, on your page. From there, if they want to go find your website and look at your social media and all that stuff, it's great. But Google My Business, man. I, I've run into so many um, uh, new entrepreneurs, so to speak, uh, who are so into this entrepreneurial thing that you're doing, whether it's a product or service, and, and the 
things on social media or whatever, and they'll say, oh, I don't have time for social media. And I have a tendency to admonish them. I say, well, you better make time. You know, just, you know, because it's out there. Yes, it is, but not, you know. It's just a part of it. You better make some time. You don't have to, because they equate it with playing around. You know, a lot of people play on social media. Oh, man, you're not going to dedicate your whole day. Get up in the morning, say something, you know, look at it on the, you know, a couple of times a day. You know, you're not going to live there, but just be present, out of sight, out of mind. And really, and I would say, like, even shifting, social media is a tool that we, like, get to use it. We don't have to. We don't have to be on social media. None of us have to be on it, right? But, like, we get to use it if we want to, if it serves us. And it can serve us a lot. You know, it can serve us well if we're, like, you know, and a lot of, I mean, I when I first started, too, I was, like, just putting out all this professional stuff. And I've One thing I say every day for the past two years, I just got back to school on one of my Facebook pages I have several. And it's one that I can't keep going away from. I can't keep going away from. Every morning. I say good morning. Mm-hmm. I try to find a clever way to say it every morning. And it's still good morning there. Uh, that's about all I say. And you'd be surprised how many people engage with that throughout the day. Mm-hmm. I might be sitting there looking or they see something or, or I might say a little something at school later, but they, they expect a good morning from me. Three great words, <laughs> and, and it, uh, I started this three great words uh, with, a, with an ellipsis, three dots, and for them to fill in the space, and they did, and they started putting that three great words just something for the, just to keep them engaged. It was during the time uh, I started this when I was uh, between when I was identifying primarily as a jazz guitarist, and since what everybody knew me as, and I hadn't released. I was preparing to release a new CD, 2014, Peace, Love, and Jazz. And in the meantime, there's a lot of empty space. I don't have nothing to tell you guys. So, so I would say good morning. Or Here's a, make a pot of coffee today. But I'd start doing three great words and, and, and encouraging statements. And they, and they really got it. And they would say their uh, love, happiness in life. You know, everybody would just take a piece of it. And they'd start looking for that. I was at a place that I was performing once. And a guy came up to me and said, I love your three great words. And he had lost a, a friend of his. And he said, he was very down. And I'm here. He comes up to me while I'm playing and says, can you, can you tell me three great words today? That was so, that was profound. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was really weird, but he was looking for that. Yeah. 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 There's a way, there's a connection, right? Yeah. Yeah. We get a great connection. I've met met two of my dearest friends now through Instagram. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, wow. Mickey, yes, we digress. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. That's cool, though, that you met in real life. Do you know him in real life now? Yeah, well, I mean, it started because we were working in the same, oh, like, okay. so it started professionally, right? Yeah. They're like, hey, let's have coffee. Anybody have a final question? <laughs> final, All right, Nathan. Final, I mean, question, Nolan. final question to top us off. Lots of artists use the excuse of being stuck or blocked. Who do you read, watch, listen to, or what mantra do you repeat to kind of pop off that creative stuff? Okay. As best I can. <laughs> uh, say it one more time. So when most artists say that they're stuck or blocked, that social media post, if you will. Who do you guys read, watch, or listen to to pop off that creative cup and just keep going? We're trying to get creative. Okay, well, this is, no, how they say no man is an island? I guess all my life, I've, for the most part, I've been able to find a lot of that within myself. It's, I guess it's my makeup. You know, I've, I, I've had some low lows. I don't know what, because I got to figure out a way to make it. And I'll come.
jazz musicians and I'll pull up the joysticks. It's an old joystick from the 60s, some old jazz or whatever. Listen to it, take me back. Some things like that kind of get back to me. But uh, you know, a lot of people don't know the joysticks were created in uh, 1976. So I listen way back, 1960s. And anyway, and those things inspire me. So I know a lot of it helps me. But so much of it is pleasure to me. I, I, I'm going to go back with the sounds. Soon she would be gone, and my life changed forever. So I, I've always been relatively resilient in, in calling on myself. I'm not trying to sound, you know, but you know. Well, I think something that's helped me is understanding that the quote unquote blocks are part of our process. So I think of it as a stream when you have like uh, rocks that start to build up, and then the, the water goes in a different direction, right? And like kind of, kind of flows in a different direction. So I don't actually necessarily think we ever lose our flow. I think it's in our mindset that we start to like bang our head up against the wall and we're like, we're not feeling it, you know what I mean? But it's really that I don't, I don't consider that I consider it. So what I do is I start to like create in some different directions. So, you know, if, I, if I'm saying, oh, I'm a painter and I can't think of anything to paint, I actually go listen to music and I might play my guitar and I start to like, you know, get inspired in that direction because that's where the flow is taking me. Um, you know, I, even with our TO, it's been my project for since my 2019, but um, the last couple months I'm like, I'm just going to start a new project. Start a new website because yeah. that was my creative, you know what I mean? And now it's just like it's, it's just living there. I'm not doing anything with that project, but it's just that was my inspiration. And then I kind of come back to 